everyone and uh, welcome again. Thank you for um, the opportunity to share with all of you on how to sharpen our intelligence. I'm going to share my screen. Somebody can please indicate that you can see it. That would be good. Yes, yes, you can go ahead. Okay. All right. So welcome again. Thank you for taking this time of um, your busy schedules to be here. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, so today we are just is session one. We have seven sessions totally. And today we're just going to get into the context of this whole matter of intelligence, or at least some basics of it. And also take probably a couple of steps into sharpening our intelligence. Simple things um, that we take, take for granted, but uh, science has been showing that they really make a difference. All right, so let's begin with just getting a sense of direction on what intelligence is. Um, Cambridge uh, Dictionary defines it as the ability to learn, understand, and make judgments or have opinions that are based on reason. The Oxford uh, Dictionary also defines it very similarly, the ability to learn, understand, and think in a logical way about things. And then it adds the ability to do this well. So we've heard a lot about IQ, the intelligence quotients, about uh, intelligent people and there are some myths that we may have heard or um, we may have read. Let's look at some of these myths and as and what the facts are. And as uh, we go through them, just think about them. All right. So myth number one, um, and this is all regarding intelligence, right? Genetics is all that matters. Have you heard that or have Sometimes maybe as we are children and um, we use this as an excuse on not doing so well. Um, the, is it the only thing that matters in intelligence? The fact is that there are many factors that contribute to intelligence and genetics is just one of them, thankfully, isn't it? The next, have you heard that your intelligence quotient does not change after the age of 18? Well, the fact is that there are ways to raise your IQ at any age, and that is amazing. Okay, how about this? People with high intelligence are generally irritating. Um, I don't know if books and movies have kind of fed into this, but is that true? Um, then would you want to be an intelligent person if that's the truth? Well, the fact is that people of all kinds of intelligent weights are equally as likely to be irritating. Okay, how about this next one? Highly intelligent people lack common sense. Hmm. What about this one? Well, the truth is that People with high intelligence can be very focused on what they're doing, um, but generally have more common sense. And I've experienced that. Um, I see wonderful people around me and I just marvel at the way that they um, grasp situations and just the common sense that they use to deal in solving problems. And uh, we appreciate them. All right, the last one. You cannot improve your intelligence, so why try it? Well, the very fact that all of us are here um, shows that we believe the fact that we can improve our intelligence, or at least we have the hope that we can in, improve our intelligence. And definitely, if you put effort into improving your intelligence, it is worth it. Well, so that, that's some facts about intelligence, but let's look at a lesson from history, right? Um, about Isaac Newton. 
a very well-known physicist and mathematician. He was born in the 1640s um, as a premature child. Um, his childhood wasn't very happy. His mother had left him to um, go start a new family. And um, his childhood was slightly traumatic and it kind of influenced the rest of his life emotionally. Um, but after the husband of that family died, um, his mother came back. Uh, he was in school, she took him out of school and he was supposed to begin his inheritance as a farmer. I don't know, you would think that hey, farming is a pretty decent job that most people could do, but he failed at it, just at farming. And so he let go of it happily and went back to school. Well, um, throughout his life, he didn't, as a student, there was nothing distinguishing about him. He got into university at Cambridge. And even at that time, he had not accomplished much. He wasn't a famous student or something that we would expect right from such um, a well-known scientist. Um, but during that time, he started studying things privately. And after he completed his bachelor's in Cambridge, um, there was a plague for about two years, something that we can identify with, right? Having gone through this pandemic still ongoing, um, it was during these two years that he made original contributions to science. Just imagine, right? Um, someone who was just common, um, who couldn't even do farming, um, took the time to study by himself apart from what was taught in college. And then at a time when his world was reeling under um, illness, um, he really shone. So that brings us to two character traits. And we are going to look every day at at least one or two character traits that will help sh sharpen our intelligence. One is curiosity. And the next is to have a love for learning. And this Isaac Newton really had. And he made so many contributions in geometry, in calculus, in physics. We know him for the laws of motion, for the universal law of um, gravitation, um, just by incorporating curiosity and sticking on with it, getting on to learning new different things. And wow, right? Intelligence or what? Well, have you ever wondered, am I curious? Uh, do I have a love for learning? Here are some very simple self-tests for all of us. So let's take the self-test for curiosity. All right. So you can, your answers to these different statements, you can strongly disagree, disagree, not agree or disagree, agree and strongly agree. And maybe you can kind of write it down or if you have awesome memory, just keep that in mind what, what your answers are to to these questions. Okay, so five questions for this curiosity self-test. First one, I can complete a puzzle or crossword without awareness of time passing by. You can get so, so engrossed with it, right? Something in the newspaper, um, a crossword or Sudoku or whatever the puzzle is. What do you agree, strongly disagree, you're neutral? Okay, remember your answer. Second one, I enjoy conversing with and getting to know strangers. Now, for me, it's very difficult to get that initial um, ice broken. Uh, I'm very shy. I have, I think my personality tends very strongly to um, liking to do things by myself and introvert. But once that barrier is broken, then I really love listening to people and listening to their stories. What about you? Okay, remember what your answer is. Third one, I enjoy observing nature, such as the flight of a bird. Or maybe you have an aquarium at home and you like to watch 
and observe the fish in it. Or you have flower plants at home and every time there's um, a bud appearing, you like to check on how it's progressing. Do you like to observe nature? Fourth one, I rarely feel bored. This is a good one. Um, I hear some children say this often. Um, I'm feeling bored. I want something to do. And some of us wonder, how can anyone feel bored? It, it just feels like there's not enough time in a day. Um, what about the fifth one? I hunger and thirst for knowledge. Okay, so just look at your answers. Now, if you have agreed more, uh, then the likelihood that you are a curious person is high, right? Very simple, straightforward test. Okay, the next um, five questions are on testing whether you're, you have a love of learning. Okay, first question. I like to learn new things. In, and it might may be that some in some fields it, it is a drag, but there are fields that interest you and you like to learn new things ab about whatever in those fields. Okay, the second one, learning is a positive experience or do you feel bogged down when it's time to learn? Third one, working on my area of interest is hard work, but it never really feels like hard work because it's so interesting, right? All right, fourth one, I cannot do this task now. Okay, maybe somebody has asked you to do something, but I will be able to do it in, a, in the future. Maybe you don't have enough of understanding or information about something, but you're willing to learn about it and you know in the future, given that you have the time to invest in going through that material that you could do something that's new. Do you agree, do you disagree strongly on both ends? Five, I enjoy tackling problems that are completely new to me. Or does it feel like, ah, I'm breaking my head over this. I don't like tackling problems. What a nuisance. Or do you love it? Okay, so what did you answer most? Just like before, if you agreed to more of these questions, to most of these questions, it, there's a likelihood that um, your love for learning is strong. Right now, these things, curiosity and love for learning, um, you don't have to be born with it. You can develop it. The more curious you get about something, the curious, more curious you will get. Right. And as you learn something that you're interested in and you ask questions, you get to learn more. Um, so those are some interesting self tests. Now, often when we talk about intelligence, we most often than not talk about intelligence, intelligence uh, quotient, the IQ. And there are standardized tests, um, you know, aptitude tests and things like that um, before we end, maybe take professional courses, um, which can be around perceptual reasoning, uh, verbal comprehension, working of memory, processing speed. But there, there, has, there is this other side of intelligence that's very important. Um, and we will be delving into it on day three and four, or four and five, right? This is the emotional intelligence, or sometimes referred to as the emotional quotient. Now, this uh, kind of began to come out in the 1950s. Um, there were various uh, people, researchers that suggested this, that studied it. Um, and in um, 1990s, Mir and Salobi started studying this in depth. And um, they started the, their models is their model for emotional intelligence is one of three accepted models. And they state that the 
emotional intelligence is the ability to monitor one's own and other people's emotions, to discriminate between different emotions, label them appropriately, and to use emotional information to guide thinking and behavior. Then in 1995, a scientist, uh, a scientific journalist, Daniel Co Goldman, um, wrote a book on emotional intelligence. And that's when the whole um, concept kind of became more popular. And in his book, he wrote that, you know, he of course observed and studied that in life and work, success is more related with emotional intelligence. Now, intel the intelligence quotient um, probably can get you a seat in a university, can get you a job, but for you to be uh, successful at that job and to become a leader, it's important to have this aspect of emotional intelligence. In fact, when people are hiring um, leadership or are trying to train teams to be cohesive, this is something that is looked um, at a lot, emotional intelligence. So um, just want to give a heads up on what emotional intelligence does not mean. It does not mean that a person who has high uh, emotional intelligence is driven emotionally, okay? It doesn't mean that. Rather, it means that you can identify your own emotions or the emotions of those around you. Um, you can bring in reasoning to probably why that is happening. For example, I myself, uh, I may be feeling sad, right? But instead of just going on through that day with this emotion, I can intervene um, by my reason and say, why am I feeling sad? Um, maybe it was because I didn't get enough of sleep or something happened. And I can intervene and react more rationally to the situations of the day rather than be driven by that emotion of feeling sad or down or angry or irritated. Similarly, when you see, you perceive other people, right? Um, maybe they're hurting you. Um, instead of being like, oh my, why? Or reacting um, in defense to being hurt, um, you could just stop that entire process there and then and say, okay, why is this happening? What may be possibilities? Maybe this person is hurt. Maybe this person didn't have a good start at home. And then you can rationally then deal with that situation. So not only can you react to a situation more positively, but you can also influence others to react positively. And that is amazing. People have two great powers. One is the power of choice. The other is the power of influence. Make these count in life. All right. So just to briefly look at our brain, because we are talking about intelligence, and of course, um, it happens in the brain. Um, this is a very basic um, function of the different lobes in the brain. Um, we have our frontal lobe, which is the seat of intelligence, right? Um, and then you have the parietal lobe um, about the center at the back. Um, and it deals with sensations, orientation. You have the occipital lobe with visual, spatial perceptions. Then you have your cerebellum, right? Right at the back, which has control, uh, coordination, control of a lot of, of voluntary movement, balance. You have your brain stem. Any injury to the brain stem is life threatening, right? Um, because things like breathing, body temperature, digestion, alertness, all that is happening there. Then you have your temporal lobe. Um, you have language, behavior, memory, hearing associated with that. But we are going to primarily be looking at the frontal lobe where your reason, your emotional intelligence, um, morality are all located. 
And of course, these lobes have even more functions, but we don't have the space on the slide, neither do we have um, time on a meeting to go through everything. There's also one part of the brain um, called the limbic system. It shares, um, it shares a bit with the temporal lobe, but is mainly, mainly at the mid of the brain. And it deals with motivation, reward, emotions, a lot of our feelings are associated with this limbic system, habits, um, memory, and so many other things. Um, so the limbic system is very important. Um, now the frontal lobe kind of develops a little later um, into late 20s or maybe even until your, the beginning of your until 30 years, uh, whereas the limbic system is in full throttle during teenage years. It is uh, closely associated, connected with endocrine glands, and endocrine glands are, of course, um, where your, all our hormones um, are released and controlled. And so um, teenagers are very, very um, vulnerable because this frontal lobe that is supposed to control reasoning and everything is just being developed. And then you have this throttle of emotions going on, um, hormones flooding the body. And so that is one time that we want to be very careful with. If your parents, your teachers, your older siblings or uncles, aunts, um, if you have a teenager that you can influence, then do your best for them. Be careful on the different inputs that can go into them um, and deal with them gently, firmly, um, but also intelligently. All right, so <clears throat> we'll take our first step um, into, not first step, I should say maybe third, because we studied about curiosity and love of learning, on how we can sharpen our intelligence. Now, Exercise is one of those things that there's so much of literature on how it is so good for intelligence. It protects uh, the frontal lobe. Um, it enhances intelligence. So we look at a couple of studies um, to just em emphasize this truth, right? So it has been shown, and this was a study that was done in India, very recent that moderate aerobic exercise practice for a long time, it can reduce stress and it also improves intelligence. Uh, another study in 2018 uh, showed that, you know, somebody has vigorous exercise, but maybe not so consistent. Um, even that improves cognitive function. But long-term exercise brings out something else. Now, a uh, few years ago, until a few years ago, we thought that the brain was incapable of producing new uh, brain cells or neurons. And we thought once the brain was formed, um, that's it. It's static. You can't change behavior. You can't change intelligence. But recent science has shown that the brain is plastic, that it can adapt, it can change. You can form new habits, you can change behaviors, you can learn new skills, and that is great news. So exercise really contributes to brain plasticity, right? It helps to improve brain function and also keep the brain healthy, keeping off neurological disease. This happens due to um, many reasons, but one thing that we want to keep in mind is something that's called the brain-derived neurotrophic, neurotrophic factors. Now, when uh, during the prenatal, during you know prenatal time, is when most of the neurons um, in the brain are formed. But then parts of the brain retain the ability to grow new neurons from neural stem cells, and that process is called neurogenesis. 
Now, neurotrophins are certain proteins that help stimulate and control neurogenesis, this production of new neurons, right? And BDNF is one of those, the most active proteins to help stimulate the growth of new neurons. And so anything that can help um, increase the BDNF is something that's good news for us. And exercise is one of them. Now, exercise also helps in the circulation of blood, right? And that helps to keep the vascular, the blood uh, vessels healthy in the brain. Uh, a lot of dementia is related to the diseased um, blood vessels in the brain. And so if we want to keep healthy memories, functioning well, being cognitively functional throughout our life, we want to make sure that our brain, um, the blood vessels in the brain are healthy. And one of the ways to keep that healthy is to have blood circulating and to have blood circulating exercise, physical activity, movement is essential. Okay, um, another kind of physical activity that has been gaining a lot of attraction in the area of um, intelligence or mental health is gardening. Um, I love gardening. And of course, I have, I have studied it uh, to a certain extent. And it is amazing how much a person can profit from gardening. Our uh, um, recent studies... Um, done uh, showed that even in elderly people, um, like just 20 minutes of gardening um, about moderate intensity um, can have beneficial uh, influences on them. Um, gardening has been shown to improve cognitive ability um, correlated with BDNF levels that we just saw, right? So it shows that even in elderly people, new neurons can be produced. So we can keep learning, we can keep sharpening our intelligence, we can keep changing behaviors and getting new skills all throughout our life. So it also helps in serotonin metabolism. Now, serotonin, we look at it um, in our sessions on um, nourishing the brain um, is a feel-good hormone. It's, it's very essential. Um, just imagine, right, if you're sad and you're going to study or work, compared to going to study or work when you're in a good mood, when would you perform your best? Definitely when you're in a good mood. And um, so our bodies are created to have these things that will help us feel good. And serotonin is one of them. Now, just for additional information, um, when we garden, we work with the soil, right? Now, in the soil, there are a lot of bacteria. One of them is called the Mycobacterium vacae. Um, it's a relative of the tuberculosis bacteria, but very, very different. This bacteria, when you work in the soil and then it gets into your body, it helps produce serotonin. So not just the fact that you are exercising while gardening, but the fact that soil also has this bacteria that can help produce serotonin contributes a lot to intelligence and also to good mental health. All right. So I would strongly recommend gardening. And if you have you know, elderly people um, who aren't so active, you would like to get them moving, but you're kind of worried um, that they might not have a sense of balance. Coordination is not so um, great. Um, you can start off with working with them in the garden. And gardening also has been shown to help develop and maintain coordination in elderly, right? So this is a great um, activity to maintain. So think about what physical activity you'd like to do, right? Um, it could be something as simple as walking briskly, very beneficial, right? Um, it could be 
jogging, right? There, there have been studies that uh, have followed those who, have, who do jogging um, and they've tested their intelligence after them jogging for three months. They've done, you know, pre-tests and then post-tests. And they found out that they, uh, these joggers did really well after these three months of uh, jogging consistently, scoring really good at tests. But then as they stopped, right, some, people, some of the joggers stopped exercising, stopped jogging, and they were tested again, this test scores started dwindling, all right? So you don't, so any form of um, physical activity is beneficial. So here are some recommendations for different age groups of uh, physical activity, right? So if you um, have the influence over pre-age, uh, preschool age children around three to five years of age, um, they need physical activity every day and throughout the day. Now, these recommendations come to us from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC. And so they're really studied, right? Um, and children need to actively play. Now, when they actively play, um, they are creative. They learn social skills when they interact with each other and play with each other. And so it's very needed for children to have physical activity in different forms throughout the day, every day. For children between 16 years of age to adolescence, about 17 years, at least 60 minutes of moderate to rigorous intensity physical activity. Um, and they need at least three times a, uh, a week of rigorous intensity, muscle strengthening activities, bone strengthening activities. Now, how do you differentiate between moderate to vigorous physical activity is a simple talk test. Um, when you're doing moderate um, activities, you can talk, but you cannot sing, okay? And when you're doing vigorous physical activities, you can not say more than a few words without taking a breath. You go out of breath soon if you try to talk. All right, so those are for children and adolescents. For adults, between 18 to 64 years of age, at least 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity physical activity. And that should include at least two days of doing strength building exercises. So you, you aim for the recommended activity level, but um, due to different challenges, just be active as you are able and slowly increase it. All right, older adults, 65 years and older, again, at least 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity activity, two days a week at least of strength building and also include exercises or activities that will help improve balance, like standing on one foot. And similarly, as um, uh, adults aim for recommended activity, but be as active as you're able and grow from there. For those with chronic conditions and disabilities, still it's 150 minutes of moderate intense activity and two weeks, two days a week of muscle strength activities. Now they may need assistance, um, another person's assistance to move their limbs or maybe even do passive things like massage. Um, but it's very important that everyone is as active as possible and to avoid inactivity. For women who are pregnant or postpartum also, at least 150 minutes um, of moderate intensity activity. Brisk walking is great. Um, and I, it may be hard. Um, there can be a lot of mood swings and different dif different challenges during that period for women. Um, but just remember that some physical activity as, is better than nothing. So do what you can do. All right. So we'll wrap around key points that we're going to take away from today's session. One is develop the characteristic of being curious. Um, develop a love of learning and move, move as much as possible, right? Just to circle back to the frontal lobe. 
The frontal lobe in human beings um, occupies a high percentage of our brain compared to any other creature. That means we are capable of most intelligence um, in all creation. And that has to mean something. There has to be huge implications that you and I have this potential to reason out and to get cues from the way people are thinking and feeling and adapt to situations um, and to make good decisions. There has to be something behind it. This shows that we have been designed amazingly. Now, when any designer designs something, there's always a purpose for that design. You have an incredible brain. You have a frontal lobe. You've been designed marvelously by an incredible designer. What is the purpose? of your existence. We'll end with that question. I'll invite you to join us tomorrow, same time for our second session on sharpening the intelligence. And we are going to talk about nourishing the brain. Thank you all for listening.